Hello, and thank you for joining today's segment of Denton's Dialogue featuring Chairman of the House Budget Committee, John Yarmouth. We have a wonderful program in store for you today. Should you have any questions that you would like to submit during the event, you may submit them through the chat box at the bottom of your screen. With that, I would now like to turn things over to Denton's partner, David Tandy. Over to you, David. All right, thank you, Maddie, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, my name is David Tandy. I'm a, a partner in the uh, Louisville office of Denton's, and we are certainly glad uh, to have all of you here with us today for this very uh, important and timely uh, Denton's dialogue uh, that we are uh, having with uh, none other than Chairman of the House Budget Committee, John Yarmouth. Um, before we get into our conversation with Congressman, uh, with Chair, excuse me, Chairman Yarmouth, we want to again remind all of you that we here at Denton's are here to service you and to help you uh, with any of the challenging and pressing needs that you may have in the public policy space, or for that matter, any uh, legal or business issue that you may have. So we encourage you to take the opportunity to uh, go to Denton's.com to check out our website and see the array of talent that we've assembled in our law firm to be able to help you, whether it be here in the United States or anywhere else around the globe. Uh, with that being said, uh, we are honored to have uh, the Honorable John Yarmouth uh, from the 3rd District of Kentucky. Uh, he is the Chairman of the House Budget Committee and is now serving in his eighth term uh, in Congress. Uh, he took over the chairmanship of the House Budget Committee in 2019. Uh, and he has been recognized for his work to improve education, expand access to affordable health care, and to revitalize manufacturing uh, here in Louisville and across the country. Um, Chairman Yarmouth was born and raised here in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, he holds uh, many titles. He is the uh, proud husband to Kathy, the father to Aaron, uh, and his uh, daughter-in-law, Sarah, uh, but I think the, the title that he is the most proud of is to be called granddad to his son, his grandson, J.D. Uh, and so uh, with that, Chairman, we thank you uh, for, uh, again, joining us here at Denton's uh, for uh, our Denton's Dialogue. And uh, we want to uh, turn the floor over to you to share with us um, just some of the little work, the, the work that's happening uh, in your uh, in your uh, budget committee. Well, thanks, David. Uh, and you're right. Uh... That's, that's my uh, number one identifier right now is JD's grandfather. And there he is, uh, he's two years and, and two months old. And uh, uh, as I tell many people, he has reminded me that there's a difference between happiness and joy. And uh, you know, I think anybody who ever has had uh, grandchildren can relate to that. This is a, a very strange uh, period of time right now because um, as, as many of you may know, we've essentially been out of Washington now for seven weeks. Uh, and while if you watch the news, you think there, that there are all these things going on in Washington and there are a lot of things going on, uh, they're going on in our absence. And uh, for so since uh, July 31st, I think we've been there uh, in Washington for two days. That was to come back and vote for the uh, reconciliation budget resolution that we are now trying to uh, move forward in, in real legislative terms. So uh, we've been doing a lot of Zooming, we've been doing a lot of phone calling, and uh, it's, again, it's been kind of surreal in a way that we are trying to package and negotiate a major piece of legislation. What, what we are proposing to do, uh, what the administration is proposing to do, and what we have we are supporting, it would be the largest single uh, piece of legislation in dollar terms that's ever uh, been passed by the Congress. So, uh, as you can imagine, it's a, a fairly daunting daunting task. Uh, but uh, we're in the reconciliation process right now. Reconciliation being the process which allows the Senate to pass something with a simple majority and, and bypass the filibuster. Um, it is part of the, the 1974 Budget Act that um, basically says that if you're doing things, and, and this is kind of a little bit in the weeds, but I think it's interesting background. It was originally written to allow you to pass, allow the Congress, the Senate specifically, 
to pass legislation that reduced the deficit. Uh, clearly, this bill is not, if it's passed, will not reduce the deficit. Uh, but in 74, they didn't write the bill very well. So it, it basically allowed the, the reconciliation process to be used to, to change the deficit, either lower it or raise it, uh, as long as it was done within the 10-year budget window. So what we're trying to do right now is pass uh, many of the uh, initiatives that were proposed in the president's original American Families Plan. He proposed two things, the American Jobs Plan, which was basically physical infrastructure, and then the American Families Plan, which includes things like early childhood education, child care, senior care, what we, what we tend to call soft infrastructure, but um, which uh, uh, there, there is a clear distinction, uh, certainly in, in many uh, members of Congress's mind. So what has happened is that we, we understood early on that there was some opportunity to have a bipartisan uh, bill that related to the, the physical infrastructure, roads, bridges, water systems, broadband, sewers, and so forth. And uh, that was negotiated. And, and successfully negotiated in the Senate where they were able to get, uh, well actually ended up getting more than 60 votes, but got at least the required 60 votes to bypass the filibuster. And so they passed that in the Senate. What members of the House said, many of them was, particularly progressive members, is that we don't want the physical infrastructure bill to be passed and and then that gives an excuse for people not to pass the, uh, the softer infrastructure bill, which for many, uh, most of us, I think, but certainly the, the progressives in the House caucus, Democratic caucus said was as high a priority, if not higher. So as you may remember, the speaker kind of tied the two together, promised the progressives that we wouldn't pass the physical bill and not pass uh, the second bill. And so right now we're, we made an agreement that we would pass, we would vote on the, the bipartisan uh, infrastructure bill on September 27th. The thought was that we would at least contemporaneously uh, in close proximity time-wise, we would pass the, uh, what we now call the Build Back Better Act. And um, that remains to be seen. <laughs> we, to, what, what we're talking about now, again, is, is something that will approach, in terms of gross spending, uh, somewhere in the $3.5 trillion range. Uh, and then on a net basis, but at least half of that, uh, because the, the, um, there will be a number of revenue raising provisions as part of this package that will make the net uh, investment significantly less than 3.5 trillion. But uh, as, as I said, the, this is childcare, uh, pre-K, universal pre-K for, uh, for three, three and four year olds, um, community, free community college, um, senior care, expansion of Medicare to include vision, hearing and dental, um, paid family leave, uh, it's a, it's a pretty expansive uh, uh, proposal, as you might might understand it. And uh, right now, what the way the process works is, 13 committees in the House and I think 12 in the Senate had jurisdiction in these areas, and they drafted the legislation to actually implement these provisions. So, like child care and early early childhood education and so forth. I'm on the Education and Labor Committee as well as uh, chairing the Budget Committee, and we had the largest single amount to basically to allocate. We had 700, about 760 billion dollars, uh, because we had jurisdiction over a lot of these areas, and uh, so we wrote our portion of the bill. Uh, the Energy and Commerce Committee has written their written theirs. The, again, there are there are 13 different committees. And then Ways and Means, 
is in the process of finalizing the tax provisions as well as the Medicare provisions because they have jurisdiction over Medicare. So all of that was supposed to be done two days ago. Most of it was, not everybody didn't quite make the deadline, but then it all comes to my committee. And we basically, uh, as some of you know, David certainly does, uh, we're the global hub of UPS in, in Louisville. And our job is to package and deliver just like UPS. So we take all of these elements put them together in one piece of legislation, which now looks like it's gonna be about 2,600 pages. Um, and then we do what's called a scrub. And the scrub is to, to go through all of that language and to, to see if any of it causes problems with the rules on reconciliation. So the rules on reconciliation basically are that any provision in the bill has to have more than an incidental impact on the deficit. So it, it can't be something that is a policy matter. You can't pass policy under reconciliation. And so we have to make sure that all of these provisions that these committees have written uh, can pass uh, uh, what's called the Byrd Rule, named after uh, Robert Byrd, and, and qualify for reconciliation. And then we will report the bill to, uh, to the Rules Committee. Uh, the Rules Committee will then vote it out with, Basically, they can make changes there. We can't change anything that's in any of the bills that are given to us in the rules in the budget committee, but the rules committee can. And they'll have a manager's amendment, which will have some changes. They'll report it to the floor and then we'll vote on it on the floor. Now, as I'm sure you know, uh, the margins are very close. Uh, in the Senate, there is no margin. We can't lose one Democrat. In the House right now, we can lose three Democrats, that's it. So we have to, uh, it, it, it's a tough slog as, as I say. And one of the things I've been doing for the last few months is hurting democratic cats. That's been my job. And uh, as I've said to all of the, you know, as I met with the Progressive Caucus and the Blue Dogs and the, uh, the New Dems and the various caucuses and individual members, and I said, look, Bottom line is you can posture all you want about what you will, what you want and what you won't accept and what you will accept. But the bottom line is you're gonna vote for this in the final analysis because you're not gonna vote against childcare. You're not gonna vote against senior care. You're not gonna vote against paid family leave and all these things. And by the way, have you met Nancy Pelosi? So uh, we're in that stage right now where we're close to uh, seeing if we can get it through the house. and. Uh, we still don't know what can pass the Senate. Uh, we've heard all the conversation about Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema, and the reservations they have about the price tag. And I will, I will close with this and then respond to questions. What, uh, what I've been saying for uh, a long time now is for the first time in my memory, uh, and my memory is getting pretty long right now, is that we, in, we, because of the Biden administration, we have started to, run, to ask the questions that you have to ask about any initiative. We, we're asking them in the right order now. What we always did in the past was say, whatever the issue, whether it was education or healthcare or you name it, the first question was, what can we afford to do? That's not the right first question. The right first question is, what do we need to do? What does this country need? What do the American people need? And once you answer that question, then you, the question is, how do you resource that? And uh, that's the way we've approached this. And, and I think that's, that's the way many of us are trying to address it in the public sphere is, these are things that the American public, the American people, the future of this country desperately need. And if we don't do them now, um, we're jeopardizing our future and the future, future generations. So uh, if once we decide that, and, and I think we've made a really good uh, effort at that. Uh, the money's easy um, uh, and we can go into that in depth, but we can find the resources to do all of these. We just have, need to have the will and, and uh, the commitment to doing it. So with that, I'll uh, stop and talk about what you want to talk about. Okay. 
Well, you know, Chairman, you you mentioned uh, that you know right now it's the uh, the what the House Ways and Means Committee is still working and deliberating and and trying to work on a couple of pieces. There are a couple of pieces in their package that um, I kind of want to tease out uh, a, a little bit, and that is one dealing with Medicare and Medicaid, and particularly the price negotiation program. Um, I think that is is being proposed. Could you kind of give us an overview as like where that stands? Is that still in uh, looking to be in the bill, or is it not? Or where where, where do we think it's going to go? All right. Well, um, as you might have heard, just um, the day before yesterday in the in the Energy and Commerce Committee, or it may have been yesterday. I lost a little bit of track of time. Uh, there was a proposal that de dealt with with negotiation of drug prices. Uh, there's joint jurisdiction there uh, because of just the commerce uh, provision or aspect of it. Energy and Commerce has jurisdiction. They also have jurisdiction over Medicaid. Uh, and then Ways and Means has uh, jurisdiction over Medicare. So what, and there were three members of the, uh, three Democratic members of that committee who voted against the proposal. Uh, and not all of them, and I'm, I'm not sure if any of them actually disagrees with the proposition that the government ought to negotiate prices, the details are what they objected to. So uh, there are those who want to allow Medicare to negotiate on a limited number of, of drugs. So like the 20 most expensive drugs and not everything out there, there are those who want uh, Medicare to be able to negotiate on any drug price. And so th th those are the kind of differences right now we're dealing with. They're not, they're not fundamental differences about negotiation. I mean, we, we passed on a number of occasions already when Democrats have been in control. Going back to 2007, uh, we actually passed a bill to allow Medicare to negotiate. Uh, the Senate never took it up because of the filibuster. And so we're still, we're still dealing with that 14 years, years later. The Senate has some different ideas. Uh, Ron Wyden, who's chairman of Senate Finance Committee, has some different ideas on negotiating. So my guess is that ultimately we will have some provision on negotiation. Uh, it won't be as expansive as some would want, but uh, again, it will deal with, probably will deal with the most frequently prescribed drugs. So, okay, Chairman, uh, I just want to, just want to jump in. That's a big saver, right? It saves, it's a, it's kind of, it's on the offset side of the ledger. So you think yeah, so that, the one will happen. Yeah, the one proposal was about $700 billion over 10 years. Yeah, it's a big save. Yeah, yeah. So, and everyone, um, if you um, have a question that you uh, would like to, to ask, submit those either in the Q&A um, box down uh, at the bottom of your screen or in the chat function and uh, we'll get we'll try to do our best to get to them if we can't get those answered uh, today and, and during the course of our webinar we'll collect those submit those to the chairman's office and, and and get a response back for those on those and get those back to you so tell us who you are uh, who you know where you who your um, your organization uh, and uh, we and we'll and we've got your email address and we can get that information back to you. Okay. Uh, with that, Sander, you you had another question. Yeah, I, wanted yeah, I wanted to. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, a lot of our folks, uh, clients who states, counties, cities, who are waiting for this infrastructure money, uh, don't really understand this pairing them together. And I know that <laughs> Congressman Hoyer said that they're going to take it up in the next work period. Uh, that's one question. So do you think that that could get signed by President Biden before all the reconciliation uh, negotiations are complete? And the second thing our financial services clients care a lot about is the debt limit ceiling. Um, uh, for obvious reasons. So I just want to see what you thought about the infrastructure bill moving and the debt ceiling. Okay, well, um, the first question is, is kind of a trillion dollar question and we're not sure about that right now. 
you know, we, uh, there are many progressives who have said they will not vote for the, the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill unless it's done uh, at the same time that we vote for the other package. So if we, if, if they're, if they are, they hold to that position, then the speaker is going to have to make a decision as to whether to um, renege on what we, the deal we passed, which was a September 27th vote on, on the bipartisan infrastructure bill. So that's kind of, you know, there are not a lot of people above my pay grade, but that one is one that is above my pay grade. And it, I, I think it, it's, you know, it's all going to, it's all going to turn on what happens in the next 10 days, obviously. So uh, uh, stay tuned. On the debt ceiling, um, this is another one where um, I'm not sure I have a good answer. Uh, as you all may know, uh, about two years ago, we agreed to suspend the debt ceiling until July 31st of this year. So that date passed. Uh, the, the Treasury Department is at this time uh, using what they call extraordinary measures to pay the bills. But basically, we can pay, we only pay the bills as money comes in. But there are there are funds that they can move around. Uh, it looks like sometime next month or early November they will reach the limit of their flexibility, and they will actually, absent a, an increase in the debt limit we would have to start making, we would start having to prioritize payments of our debt, uh, which is not something that we want to do. We, we got to this point back in 2011, I think, um, and it's either 11 or 13, but it, it was a, uh, we actually had the country's uh, credit rating uh, drop by a small amount, but it was actually the first time it's ever been dropped. And the markets did not respond uh, favorably to that. So that's kind of what we're facing. The, the debt limit law was passed in 1917. We have raised the debt limit approximately 100 times since then, most of the time without any controversy. We raised it several times during the Trump administration when the Republicans were in control. Uh, and Democrats voted to do that because it's the responsible thing to do. Raising the debt limit is something that um, to me is, should, should never be partisan. Uh, this is basically paying our bills. And I, I joked on television um, last week that I said, these people must have gone to the Trump School of Business so that they don't have any problem running up debts and not paying for them. But this, that's what this was, would amount to. We would, we would default on our debts. And um, Mitch McConnell, uh, my senator and my constituent, has, has said uh, in, bizarrely that uh, because we are in control that we have, to, we have to do it by ourselves, that Republicans are not going to provide any votes. And when I say bizarrely, it's because he basically said Republicans are willing to default on the debt, and which is totally irresponsible. And Mitch is on the record many times saying we can never let the, the country default on the debt. We will, you know, but Mitch doesn't care about obviously doesn't care about um, being accused of changing mind or hypocrisy. Take take your pick. Uh, we are the only country in the world that has a debt limit that works this way. The only country in the world. There are a couple of other countries who have a debt ceiling, but their debt ceiling automatically rises when they spend more money. So, uh, which is something that I think Dick Gephardt proposed uh, years ago when he was in the House. So, our options right now, if assuming that Mitch is right, that no Republican is going to vote to raise the debt ceiling, and that we we, you know, it's so, that, that vote would be subject to the filibuster. Um, we can do a couple things. We can put it into the reconciliation bill, or we can create another reconciliation bill just to deal with the debt ceiling. The law allows us to do that. That re would require us to actually specify a figure 
And that's what that's what Mitch's game is, by the way. He wants us to put in reconciliation. So our members would have to vote for $35 trillion in debt or something like that, as opposed to just a, a time limit. Um, our leadership doesn't want to do that. So then the question is, do you put the debt ceiling, uh, raising the debt ceiling into another piece of legislation like the National Defense Authorization Act, which we have to vote on in the next couple of weeks, which is always considered a must pass bill by Republicans and Democrats, uh, whether we put it as part of a continuing resolution, which we're also gonna have to do within the next 13 days, which is keeping the government open uh, because we have not passed appropriations bills. So we have to keep the government open past the end of the fiscal year, which is September 30. Um, and again, this is a discussion that leadership is having and there has not been a final decision made as to how to proceed. I am confident that the debt ceiling will be raised. It is unthinkable that we wouldn't do it. Um, my recommendation, which I made to the speaker is that we just have a vote to raise the debt ceiling to a gazillion dollars. And that way we'll never have to worry about it again. I'm only half kidding about that. Um, but we really need to do away with it. We need to change the law because the only purpose it, is, it serves right now is to allow one party or the other to engage in brinkmanship and, and basically blackmail. So um, it, it's damaging. Create some certainty in financial markets, and uh, we need to we need to figure out how to get out of this box. But we will. And I believe the uh, deficit, the debt went up over seven trillion under the Trump administration, right? Under the Trump administration, yeah. seven trillion. Yeah. Uh, one other thing, uh, we have a lot of universities and agricultural clients, business clients, who are very supportive of the immigration provisions in the Judiciary Committee portion. You're doing the bird rule scrub, probably your staff as we speak. Uh, what do you think the prospects are for those? Well, that's a great question. As I mentioned before, under the, uh, under the reconciliation rules, you can't make policy. A lot of immigration reform is policy. Just, so it matters how you write it. And we're, we're trying to draft those provisions in a way that it has more than an incidental, those reforms would have more than an incidental impact on the, on the deficit. Uh, it's ultimately up to the Senate parliamentarian. She, makes the, she will make the decision as to whether that's uh, convertible or not. And the, the one thing that I think those of us who favor immigration reform is that uh, there is some precedent for reconciliation being used to pass immigration reform. Uh, it goes back to about 2005. So it's not, it's not a perfect analogy with what we're trying to do now, but there, there, again, there is precedent for use, and precedent matters in, in these decisions uh, by the parliamentarian. So I know that, I know that uh, Senator Schumer and many others feel pretty optimistic that we can do the, Particularly with the Dreamers and uh, some of the some of the uh, the guest worker programs that have been basically negotiated, starting back in 2013 when I was part of the gang of eight in the House that was dealing with immigration reform. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, agreement from, for instance, the employers and and workers, whether it's farm workers and the and the growers. Um, and the U.S. Chamber and, and organized labor. There's a lot of agreement that's been reached. And clearly, they have they have an impact on the budget because you're going to have a lot of people working, immigrant uh, immigrants working, paying taxes and so forth. The question is, the parliamentarian is going to have to decide: is that incidental or is that uh, are we really trying to make policy? And do you think you'll make those calls before the House passes the bill, or will you? sort of debate that, argue them over once it passes the House? The position we take is that's the Senate's problem. <laughs> we're going to pass what we're going to pass. OK. Yeah. But, um, but, but, Sander, we've been doing a lot of, I mean, for months, we've been talking, 
our staffs, committee staffs, and then working with the Senate staffs to coordinate to see how close we can get to, to avoid many of these problems of conflict between House and Senate. So I know judiciary staffs have been working in concert to, to try and resolve this thing so that whatever we pass uh, would be what the Senate would pass or try to pass. Chairman, one other. One of the, well, I got one question to jump, jump in here real quick yeah. on the, with regard to, you know, because we talked about the um, uh, negotiation uh, pricing program under Medicaid and Medicare. Um, a question here as asked is extending government negotiated drug prices to the commercial market. Uh, is that quote birdable, meaning would it pass the bird amendment? Your thoughts on that? Commercial market. I don't think anybody's proposing that. Um, okay. You know, that, it goes on every day already. Uh, there, you know, it, negotiations go on with between hospitals and so forth on a, on a regular basis with the drug. Uh, the biggest problem is that Medicare is the single biggest purchaser of, of drugs. And uh, when, when uh, the Republican Congress passed the prescription drug benefit in 2003, they put in this legislation a prohibition against negotiation. They basically did the pharmaceutical companies bidding and put this prohibition in the law. It makes absolutely no sense. Uh, and as a consequence, we basically end up not only paying more than we should for virtually every drug, but we're subsidizing the rest of the world uh, because virtually no one pays the same prices, nearly as high a price for the same drug as we do in the United States. Uh, so th this is a, it's a very self-defeating uh, proposal. And you know the argument the drug companies use is, uh, is well, you know, if you do this, then we it'll stifle innova innovation and so forth. And the re my response is that over the last five years, the largest drug companies have spent five hundred and fifty something billion dollars on stock buybacks and dividends, and only a tenth of that in research. Mm. So the idea that um, by forcing negotiation, we're going to somehow uh, cut their research budget is nonsense. Okay. Chairman, here's another question. It, it says that the package, um, the reconciliation package could ultimately invest hundreds of billions of dollars in new school, in new buildings, uh, schools, affordable housing, et cetera. And um, there are bird rule questions around what kind of sustainability or climate criteria can be included. Do you have thoughts on how we can ensure we build sustainable buildings that don't uh, lock in decades of wasted energy and unnecessary carbon emissions? Yeah, it's a great question. And oh, again, ultimately that's for the parliamentarian, but my thought is that because the mechanism for doing this directly impacts the budget, I mean, it's, it's not like there's a minor impact to the budget. This is all, because it's all, tax incentives and, and direct payments and federal payments and tax incentives. Uh, I think there are, I think we're on pretty down to get that uh, past the bird rule because it, it's far more than incidental. Actually, we're, yeah, yeah, we're trying to accomplish a policy uh, objective, but we're doing it in uh, basically 100% uh, budgetary ways. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and in addition to that, there's also other provisions uh, within the reconciliation, particularly I think in the, in the ways and means, or it might actually be in, um, in, your, um, in your other committee, uh, where schools are being uh, given money to uh, you know, reinvest in their, quote, their infrastructure. So meaning, uh, you know, fixing dilapidated schools, bringing them uh, more up to date in order to you know meet the needs of their uh, student population that they're currently uh, engaging in, and I guess really the issue then gets into can can Congress through reconciliation tell them, but you must do your uh, infrastructure in this particular way as opposed to just saying we're giving you the money to do it, you figure out the best way to do that. Yeah, I, um, that's probably more of a philosophical question than it is. Uh, a technical question and we're dealing here with technical rules and, mm -hmm. and I think again because this is a hundred percent a policy that is a hundred percent budget 
oriented that uh, the you know the philosophical objective behind it, the policy objective, probably won't matter. Mm -hmm. Right, and then also interestingly, in there in the reconciliation package as well, there are tax credits for um, the purchase of. Uh, if, if someone were to buy a union made electric vehicle um, and, and, and put it into service before, I want to say 2027, there are credits there. I guess that, that's a way of trying to spur manufacturing, first of all, uh, and all the ancillary production that goes along with it, including you know, the battery manufacturing, et cetera. Um, but then also trying to help with uh, overall climate change issues as well you think those, those that that will gain support moving forward yeah I, you know david i think you could probably on almost anything we we're doing with reconciliation you can find policy implication behind mm -hmm. and you know two years of universal uh pre-k a third three and four year olds is something that you can say this is you know there, this is a policy because we need to uh, make sure that our children have the best educational foundation they can possibly have, regardless of what kind of background they come from. Uh, but again, the, the the budgetary impact is is, is total. So I, again, I think we're probably we're probably on solid ground on most of these things. Mm -hmm. There's another question about the payments to utilities to produce more green energy. Are you confident those could pass the Senate parliamentarian? Yeah, I'm pretty, again, when you're talking about dollars uh, or tax credits primarily, I, I think we're on solid ground. But, you know, probably the, the closest one I can talk about is Dreamers because um, clearly, if you're trying to give a legal permanent status and ultimately citizenship to dreamers, that is primarily a, a policy change because there's really no, there's no implication for the budget. I mean, we're not providing any extra benefits to dreamers. Uh, you know, ultimately, yeah, if they become citizens, they, they qualify for certain benefits, but uh, that's that's pretty much incidental. Right now, there'd be no there'd be no change in the deficit if you legalize all the dreamers. But if you change if you charge fees for the dreamers to become permanent have permanent status, then you have a budget implication. So that's to me that's kind of on the on the more questionable side of of the bird rule. Uh, these other things where you're just spending money or giving tax credits, I don't think there's much problem with any of that. Okay. One uh, other thing, can I ask, uh, David? Wait, uh, uh, the, everyone uh, is I, a lot of people aware of this uh, controversy, and I'm sure you've heard from your uh, colleagues in New Jersey and New York and Connecticut and Massachusetts about the salt caps. Uh, it seems like you've got some intra-caucus divisions on that. Do you, is there a solution out there? Or? I think that's a reasonable uh, statement. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so this any change in the SALT deduction was not included in the Ways and Means provision. Um, there is an anticipation that in the manager's amendment, which ultimately goes to the Rules Committee, and that theoretically the floor will, will have a change in, in the SALT deduction. Um, and I know they're working on it in the Senate as well, but you've got, again, the, the New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts. I mean, we have, we have a 5% uh, tax in Kentucky too that I, you know, I, I, the, salt, the SALT deduction uh, affected me. And you know, so I, uh, I, would, I wouldn't mind, but, it is a substantial amount of money uh, that uh, it would add to the, the cost of the package. Thank okay. you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we've got a couple of other questions here too. Um, 
One is, will the tax-exempt bond advance re, uh, refunding be reinstated for municipalities to allow for refinancing of higher yield, yielding outstanding debt? I, that's a question I have no idea about. I just can't okay. answer that. That's, I, and I, that's one we'll uh, have to get you an answer for. But no I, problem. I think I saw that in some of the in in some of the kind of breakdowns of what's in the package. There, what they're talking about is from the uh, with regard to it's a, a reinstatement of like the uh, Build America bonds that were issued under the 2009 uh, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. So it's a similar. Uh, kind of a policy proposal there uh, to help municipalities um, kind of continue to spur um, infrastructure right. and growth in their respective communities. Um, yeah. But yeah, but we'll. But as the chairman said, we can get you an answer to that. Yeah, uh, I just to that question as well. Um, one other one I have here is I, I can't remember if we touched on it or not, but uh, with regard to the clean energy payment program, Senator, did you ask that one yeah, already? Yeah, I asked okay. that. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, so folks, I mean, this is to kind of go to show you. I mean, we are reading what's in the chat and are trying to work it, you know, to work it in. So uh, I have not been one to be able to do two to three things at one time. So <laughs> I do apologize for wasting time on that if I uh, if I got messed that up. Um, one other uh, question uh, that we have here does um, it, it, it gets into it says that, is there any concern? Uh, regarding the uh, the onerous increases in taxes being proposed, such as raising the highest marginal rates to uh, 39 uh, from 39 percent to six, uh, 39.6 percent, uh, extending the uh, uh, the NIIT to uh, 3.8 percent uh, or more with regard to income, or for that matter, uh, charging the 3 percent surcharge tax. On income over uh, five million um, on certain uh, individuals, um, will there be any opportunity uh, for uh, those tax rates to be um, adjusted um, in, a, in a downward manner? Um, well, first of all, they, you know that that's the proposal that came out of Ways and Means. We don't know what Senate Finance is going to do. Um, I don't think on the Democratic side there is any real concern. Uh, nobody thinks that's a problem. And I think you know, we almost universal, I mean, unanimously opposed the 2017 tax cuts, uh, which cut the top rate from 39.6 to 37, uh, and the corporate rate from 35 to 21. And so, yeah, I just don't see much concern on the, on the Democratic side. Obviously, there are Republicans who are concerned about that. I think, you know, there, if you look at what the, the president initially proposed, the, the House Ways and Means Committee actually um, came in a lot lower in terms of uh, taxing the wealthiest Americans than the president proposed because he proposed taking the capital gains rate basically to the ordinary income rate, uh, which would have been essentially 43% for um, gains over a million dollars. Senate uh, House Ways and Means came in at 25, raised it to 25, from 20 to 25%, the capital gains rate. They wanted to do, uh, eliminate stepped up basis. And the Ways and Means Committee did not go for that. So um, I think for those who are concerned about higher taxes on the wealthy, Ways and Means actually moved in, in that direction. Um, I think the, there's more concern among members of the, the House Democratic Caucus about ways and means being too easy on the very wealthiest people, mm -hmm. not too and, and so I think just kind of to wrap things up, when we're talking about like what's going on in, on the House side with the, the reconciliation package, yeah. that then bill might, like all legislation, goes over to the Senate and then they have their opportunity to um, you either pass it as is, or they're going to make adjustments and amendments to that reconciliation package as well. 
right? And then now after that's done, and they, you know, so you get both chambers have to come to an agreement in order to pass the reconciliation, correct? Well, and, and, and as you know, I mean, we can lose no votes in the Senate, we can lose three votes in the House. So it's, it's very, very difficult. We originally hoped to be able in the House to what we call pre-conference the entire bill. Pre-conferencing mean we, we agree with the Senate that they tell us what they can get 50 votes for and we tell them what we can get 218 votes for. Um, that doesn't look like it's gonna happen so that we will be involved in in a either a ping pong uh, scenario or a conference scenario, ping pong being we pass something, the Senate passes something different, it comes back to us. We either ask what the Senate sends, sends or make changes and send it back. That's why they call it ping pong. Ping pong. Um, but it, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to pass the same bill uh, as we had hoped to be able to do, as we did with the budget resolution document. And another wrap up, uh, just uh, is there is it is there agreement at least among your colleagues that failure to pass an infrastructure bill and reconciliation is just not an option that that's that would be just failure and uh, terrible outcome. I think there is agreement, Sandra. I, I, you know. I've, I've watched very carefully, parsed very carefully the statements that have been made by the various people like Pramila Jayapal, who's chair of the Progressive Caucus, and Stephanie Murphy, who's chair of the Blue Dogs. And they've never said that there were, they've never said they, that, uh, that they were not interested in passing the, this proposal, a proposal. So, I think everybody's left themselves enough room. And you know, when we went through our markup last week in energy, I mean in education and labor, and we had a number of differences, some pretty significant, but in the final analysis, every Democrat voted for the final product. And and I suspect that's what we'll see. Where that's going to end up is another question, whether it's a 3.5 trillion gross spending or whether it's something less is, you know, that's, that remains to be seen. But ultimately, I think with, with one exception, and that's Kurt Schrader from Oregon, who said he's not going to vote for anything. Uh, I've not heard that from anybody else. And I think everybody else uh, understands that um, this is probably the, the greatest opportunity they will have in their, in their legislative careers to yeah. pass transformational legislation. Yeah. I think everybody gets that. And um, uh, I hope that ends up Great, thank you so much. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, we, we appreciate you uh, spending some time with us and our, our, our viewers uh, here this, uh, this afternoon. Is there anything else that you'd like to, uh, to talk about? There, I'm sure there's tons of other things we could talk about, you know, like the uh, the uh, John Lewis uh, voting voting act and whether or not uh, Senator Manchin is going to find 10 colleagues in the Senate to uh, come on board with his uh, proposal. But, you know, we, we want to give you the opportunity to kind of uh, put a bow on this discussion for today. Oh, uh, well, I, you know, I could I could talk a lot about uh, Senator Manchin. I could talk a lot about the filibuster. Um, you know, I, I think it's pretty obvious to me that the, the filibuster has to go, that uh, what we've created in this country through nobody's fault, it just happened, is, is basically a minority rule situation. Uh, the founding fathers uh, warned uh, about that. They, and they, they talked about the fact that the majority always, in, a, in an American democracy, the majority ultimately always has to prevail. If not, we don't have a democracy. And unfortunately, we're not in that position right now. We're in a minority rule situation, largely because of the filibuster. So uh, we, have to, we have to figure out a way to get around that. Um, if, if we want to do any, if, we wanna, if Congress uh, is to function in a, a meaningful way. So I don't want to talk about that. I do want to talk maybe just a second about the whole question of debt and whether we should worry about it. Uh, because that's going to be part of this big discussion because we're going to 
we will add some some figure to the national debt but through this bill if we pass it it won't be 3.5 trillion it'll be something less probably closer to half but um you know, i've there's a, a new way of thinking about debt um, and deficits. It's labeled modern monetary theory, MMT. I was very skeptical skeptical about um, MMT when I first learned about it, but I've studied and, and I've talked to many people. And what modern monetary theory holds is that basically, if you are a country with a sovereign currency and you buy and and borrow in your, in your own currency, that there is no limit to what you can spend. The only limit is what, what the economy can absorb. And so those people who say that we can't afford to do this, we can afford to do whatever we want to do. The only constraint is if we, that we have to have the resources to do it. So theoretically, if we want to say we could give every household and every family in the country a $200,000 voucher to buy a house, we could afford to do that. We could create the money to do it. But what would happen? Uh, we already have a housing shortage. Uh, there's no way to drive the price of, of houses way, no, no pun intended, through the roof. And it would be a meaningless exercise. But we're nowhere near that point in terms of doing what we're proposing to do here now. And Jay Powell, who's chairman of the Federal Reserve, a Republican uh, appointee, has said, we have enough fiscal space to make these kinds of investments because these are smart investments that will improve the lives of our citizens, will make their futures brighter, and therefore make the economy brighter. So uh, I, I just, I, I hope people won't focus on the fact that we have $28 trillion, or not $29 trillion worth of debt, uh, and now we're gonna add something to it. We, we have the money to do it, uh, and we have the capacity in, in our country to do it. And then most importantly, we have the need to do it. Uh, as I said to somebody the other day during our markup, you know, because the Republicans always say, we're burdening our grandchildren with all this debt. And I said, no, we're not. I mean, we've been accumulating debt in this country for 230 years. Nobody's ever been asked to pay it off, right? I mean, when, Abraham, when, the, debt got, when the national debt got to a billion dollars under Abraham Lincoln, I'm sure there were people saying, we're burdening our grandchildren with this debt. And when it hit a trillion dollars under Reagan, I know people were saying that. Uh, that's not the way our debt works. Our, if you take the 28 or $29 trillion worth of debt that we, we call debt right now, don't think of it as debt. Think of it as that's the amount of money minus taxes that the government has invested in the, in the country over its history. And that's what it is. When the government runs a deficit, it's, it's somebody else's surplus. And in most cases, it's the American people's surplus. So when we, we run a deficit, to provide childcare or to provide education and so forth. The people benefit, it's their surplus, it's the government's deficit. But the government can create the money. And uh, that's what, you know, that, that's the way I think we need to think about these things that um, it, it's, the other part of it is what we will be, if we don't do this kind of thing right now, what we will be burdening our grandchildren and great grandchildren with is 100-year-old schools instead of 50-year-old schools, uh, a workforce that's not educated and trained instead of one that is, a climate that's uninhabitable instead of one that is. I mean, these are the costs that our grandchildren will bear if we don't make these kind of investments now. Well said, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As always, we appreciate your time. Uh, and to all of you who are, have uh, joined us uh, today and, and participating, we thank you for, uh, for logging on and, and being a participant uh, in our uh, webinar uh, and dialogue today. If you have any other questions that come to you uh, later on or that you're looking to get answers from the chairman, um, uh, please uh, feel free to contact your Denton's relationship partner, or you can email Sander Lurie at sander.lurie at dittons.com, or you can email me at david.tandy at dittons.com. 
and we would be happy uh, and eager to uh, relay your your message to the to the chairman and his staff. We'll get an answer for you, and we'll be here to help you in any way that we can uh, moving forward. Whether to get those answers, uh, those questions answered, or for any that matter, any other uh, pressing need that you may have for yourself or your organization. With that, we thank you again for your time, and we look forward to seeing you again at another one of our Denton's dialogue. You'll have a great day. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.